Hello. Hello. I unmuted myself. Yay. Yay. We're like early. I'm just all getting situated. I started working Wednesday mornings. Oh, how's that working for you? Well, it's good when you have the right patients on Wednesday morning. <laughs> yes, this is true. I oh, saw two patients this morning myself. We're not supposed to do this on Wednesdays. I know. It was a thing, though, because I can't see anybody tomorrow because George is going to his cardi cardiologist at 1.30. Gotcha. So I No. So Friday. And then next week, it's like we're starting. And I haven't even... I'm really sorry to everybody that's on the waiting list. I haven't even sent out that letter. That's on my to-do list tomorrow morning. Good. I could do that tomorrow. Yes. And while we're at our to-do list, we have to put in the, the sports course that I want to hold at the clinic there because that will be great. I think yeah. in the fall we should do it because the fall in Portland is pretty. Fall in Portland. Well, if we get it at the right time. So <laughs> before it starts raining. Yes. And after it's uh, 103. Yes. In September. So, and I don't get back from... Germany, because I go to England, Ireland, and then Germany. And I think I'll be back like October 4th. So we can do it after that. Yay. You're so busy. Well, I didn't mean to be. I wasn't supposed to be. Everything was still supposed to be shut down. And now not. No. So there we go. Yeah. How's the, how's the week been? You've been at the clinic um monday and tuesday yep i have what are, what are our updates everything is working fine you have everything's working fine i have five machines on a patient and i have a patient with a condition i have only treated twice Ooh. And yeah and the first two times i treated it i actually didn't know anything about it i only knew the peripheral mechanisms this time I looked up the central mechanisms okay. and it's really challenging in part because it's so rare and because it's so complicated. Cool. So it's called post serotonin. I think the SD stands for sexual dysfunction, but it's caused by, it's caused when you give an adolescent male, usually they're males, an SSRI. And then at some point, you either while they're on the SSRI or after they come off of it, um, they have anhedonia, which means they can't feel any pleasure. And they have erectile dysfunction. Orgasm doesn't work real well. Um, the first one I saw, the first two I saw actually, had lost their sense of taste. So they couldn't taste. Wow. They could smell, but not taste. And it's permanent. And there's no treatment. And so this time, I looked it up. And this is like random neurologic geek stuff, right? It's Do never you know random. 14 different serotonin receptors, 14 different types. And within those types, there are subtypes. And when you look up the serotonin and the dopamine pathway, so dopamine is how you feel pleasure. Yeah. And these people can't feel pleasure. It's anhedonia, which is the inability to feel happy. And that's dopamine. Right. So how does an SSRI, serotonin receptor, cause a dopamine problem. What's up with that? Hmm. So this time I actually looked it up because I had time. I knew this guy was coming. And the serotonin nuclei and the dopamine nuclei in the medulla are right next to each other. And the receptors are similar in construct. Like 
how they're built. Mm -hmm. And then the pathways are parallel all throughout the brain. That's a good face. <laughs> and then it's like, what? So I, what do I do with this person? Right. Yeah. And it's been 11 years. So the first one I was successful with accidentally because sexual function is a delicate balance between parasympathetic libido. So parasympathetic in Vegas, mm -hmm. libido. An erection is parasympathetic, but ejaculation and orgasm are sympathetic. Right. So they have to be balanced. And they're not. It's just, it makes your brain hurt. So the first one was easy. It was like two sessions. At the end of the first session, he went out to dinner and he could actually taste wow. food for the first time in five or six years. Wow. Second guy, not so much. And then this one, I thought, you know, if I'm going to treat this, I should probably know something about it. So I look, looked it up. There's not even an ICD-10 code for it. Wow. Yeah. So, so that was my day, Monday, Tuesday, and today. And then the other patient was somebody that was at the core seminar. Hmm. And she had a low back thing and she had a shoulder thing. And I thought she was coming for the shoulder thing. Well, it turns out, <laughs> turns out she's an 81 and 10. So the shoulder thing was associated with her neck. And she had this pain in her groin. And I thought, it's just scarring in the femoral nerve. Palpated it, ran 13 and the nerve didn't do anything. It never doesn't work. So it couldn't be. It, her hamstrings are kind of tight. She has a disc bulge in her neck. I wonder. So I ran 81 and 10. Adductor pain completely went away. The tone in the adductors went away. What's up with that? I mean. I love 81 and 10. I isn't it amazing. I don't know how you do this, how you always like tap and hack into my list before I'm ready to talk about anything, yeah. but you, you do um, it. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I had a, I had somebody who, who wrote to me, they're, they're way back on the COVID, um, or they're way back on the podcast, um, watching and listening. And they said, you know, you and Dr. Carol should have really quarantined when you had COVID. And I said, Dr. Carol and I don't live in the same state. We got COVID a week apart just because that's what happened. <laughs> that's just how we roll. But just to clarify that everybody, we, we are not together. <laughs> so that one day in Phoenix, it was so wicked cool. I know somebody else wrote in, they said, you need to do that again. It was like watching like the funniest newscast of all time. <laughs> Good story. That was great. Well, um, speaking of quarantine, it's like when COVID first hit in March, when I got back, um, the two businesses, FSM is in my dining room and PDI is in this room off the uh, family room. And we had just set up, without knowing COVID was coming, we had just set up the phones and the computers so everybody could work remotely. Wow. And so for the first three months, there was nobody in the house. Yeah. They were all working remotely. One person would come in in the afternoon and do the shipping and send out, you know, DVDs or custom cares or converters or whatever but yeah the whole quarantine thing was and i for me to to not be on a plane for a year and a half after not being off a plane like i changed time zones twice a month since yeah. 2000 so it's like covid was really sort of fun for me i liked being quarantined and now it's like 
I know where I'm going to be, what city I'm going to be having dinner in, in September. Right. Yeah. It was, we got to rewrite the core. We got to write, rewrite so many things. So I am grateful for that time. Or where webinars, like the webinars, Ehlers Danlos, but well, the, the flu virus webinar, Ehlers Danlos, Mold, Vegas, yeah. all of those happen. That's what happens when you leave me at home for 18 months. <laughs> and thank goodness for those. So there, somebody did ask a question about the vagus nerve. And I, I typically just refer people to the webinar because, that you did on vagus, because if you haven't taken the core, the advance in the last two years, probably, right? That's when you you started adding it in. Yeah. Um, you need to listen and watch it and have that in your bank. So I will start with that, actually. Somebody had had mentioned, I guess we had talked about it. She mentioned the podcast, but I didn't rewrite it down, that you had said there are certain um, professions that police officers that you wouldn't want to treat the Vegas in. Right. And um, police officers, firemen, um, black ops, military, um, guys that are just not safe, right? Where they actually need to be jacked up. Um, that's, you treat them on their day off. It's kind of like when you treat football players, you don't treat them the day before a game. Right. You treat them after a game, you put their gut back together, you turn the Vegas back on. Practice is not usually high impact contact. So you can treat them in the week between games. It's what make, makes treating baseball players so hard because they never have a day off. Right. That's another conversation. But um, the vagus nerve quiets down the stress response system. Now the good news about the way the nervous system works is if you're under stress or you have an infection or you have a broken thingamajig, the, the vagus carries impulses up to the brain and the brain will turn the vagus down or off faster than you can turn it on. So even when somebody has, let's say, mold or a parasite, you can turn the vagus on and that'll give them an hour long break and then the central nervous system says, yeah, no, and turns the vagus back down again. So their pulse goes from 66 back up to 80, 82. And that's just how it goes. So these days on myself, like we used to run, well, we would still run, I guess, 40 and 116 to quiet the immune system. That we know, we have data that that actually works. These days on myself, I just turn the vagus on. I let the vagus decide how much it is safe to turn down inflammation because that's what the vagus does. The vagus controls the immune system. So you can directly slam the inflammation down locally and then turn the vagus on and let the vagus and the immune system have a conversation about whether or not it's safe to do that and how much it should be done and for how long. Right. Isn't that cool. What did we do without it? Honestly, like. No, I, I see it. It's on me. I got, so after I was on functional medicine update in 2000 or 99, whenever that was, this cardiologist in Beverly Hills, called me and said, would you come to Beverly Hills and work in my office? And it's like, rodeo dive, cardiologist. I'm a chiropractor that is six years out of school. Okay, fine, sure, you know. And so I went down there and we worked on various things. And then this patient came in in ventricular tachycardia and his heart rate was... 140, 150, it's a good face. Oh. And the cardiologist put him on this thingy that squishes 
I can't remember the name of it, but it squishes the um, um, squishes pressure in the legs to increase back pressure in the heart. But it also put the man's heart rate on audio on a speaker in the room. So I'm hearing this. And I thought the only way I know to slow down the heart is increase secretions in the vagus. So I did that. And his heart rate went from 150 down to 72 in about 30 seconds. And wow. it quite scared the bejesus out of me. I, like literally, it's like, oh my God, this really works. So this was back in 2000 when, yeah, I hadn't really convinced myself that it works all the time, every time, and it actually does what we think it's doing. So the, um, yeah, so there's that. So I didn't touch it again until Diana Cross did her presentation in 13 or 15. And she talked about what the Vegas does. And I was like, okay, I need to get over this. So after that symposium, I came home and I sat on the couch with a pulse ox made around my finger and a blue box around my neck and down on my abdomen. And I ran increased secretions in the vagus and I watched my pulse and my normal pulse is 60 to 64. And I watched it and it went from 64 to 62 and then back up to 64. And then I ran it on other people that were volunteers and if your pulse is normal and it's not elevated due to vagal dysfunction, running increased secretions in the vagus won't change it. It's like, cool. That, that was when I stopped being afraid to run it, to treat it. And it was, it's been transformational. It's like vocal cord dysphonia and SIBO and gastroparesis and autoimmune disease. There's no way to treat an autoimmune disease. And if you look at autoimmune disease, every single one of them starts with infection, stress, or trauma. I was fine until. How cool is that? It's, it's so cool. Um, yeah. So yeah, thanks for the, for the question, the comment about um, why would we not want to treat the vagus? Um, so yeah, certain, certain professions definitely are athletes have to be in a certain amount of stress to function at that level. So my professional athletes that have a custom care, I do have concussion in Vegas on there for them, but I will tell them run this when you have a few days in between a game, run it in the off season, run it at Christmas break, run it, whatever, not the day of game. Run it on the plane on the way home or the bus. Yes, it's, it's definitely a good part of the recovery um, um, programs. But yeah, that's not a pregame kind of program that you want to run. This is not running it on the way to work kind of thing. Oh, and police officers, if you're on desk duty or you're a detective who isn't in the field. Sure. That's easy. Yeah. If, but um, street police officers like no and firemen usually work three days on and four days off or four and three whatever mm-hmm. and so they run it in the off times yes yes and even if you have it turned on and you get a call and you have to go the central nervous system will turn it back off again sure it's like it's instantaneous isn't that cool the yes. nervous system it's just so cool i know I love the way it feels. I love, um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was therapist, um, self-care because I had a fantastic slam dunk, really easy week, really clear cut cases, nothing weird, nothing I couldn't figure out. Um, the universe owed me one because last month was, a 
poop show. It was crazy. Yeah. Um, that was the, you know, you're driving home from work, slamming your head on the steering wheel going, what was that? <laughs> And, and spending my whole night Googling things to try to figure out what I could have missed because my brain has to now go in a thousand different directions all at the same time because it's never the muscle. Yeah. Thanks for that. Oh, I have one from today. Okay. Okay. So this practitioner, she's an 81 and 10 to begin with. And then um, she had this one spot on her iliac crest. And over the weekend, I said, oh, that's just from where the sartorius or something attaches to the iliac crest. And we ran 124 and 73, torn and broken in the periosteum, torn and broken in the connective tissue, and it got a little less tender. So she comes in yesterday and it's still really tender. Well, I got distracted treating other things. She comes in today and it's still jump tender. And then in her history yesterday, she said, oh yeah, I have a compression fracture at T12, L1, T12 or L1, it's like, oh. And then it's right in this one inch strip along, it's like in a very specific section of the iliac crest and torn and broken didn't cover it. And it's, then I looked up at the dermatome diagram. It's like, that's a T12 L1 nerve root goes right. It couldn't be that easy. So I treated inflammation and scarring in the periosteum in the back and then did inflammation and scarring in the nerve in the T12 nerve root from her spine to the iliac crest and it was done. I didn't have to look it up. I just had to look at, look at it. Look at the dermatome diagram. And it's like, when is the iliac crest, not the iliac crest? Right. When is T12 and L1 nerve root? A, Duh. <laughs> uh, As you always say. <laughs> You know, the, the biggest question, so when we talk about FSM, we always talk about what is wrong and where is it happening, right? We love those two words, like what and where, but I think we have to scrap that all. And I think we have to go back way in the beginning and just say, why? Why oh. is this happening? I mean, like mechanism of action kind of thing, mechanism of injury? All of it. I'm, I'm a chart person. So anybody that's been to any of my courses, you see all these colorful little float charts and bubble charts, because that's just the way my brain thinks. So I do start with what's happening, right? What, what are the symptoms? What am I objectively seeing? Where is it? But before you can start at those two places, you have to think, why? Why is that lighting up? Why is that painful? Oh, okay. And I think okay, that I really helps... Why. What's that? I was thinking of a bigger why, but yeah. Why? And sometimes it is a bigger why, right? And sometimes it is. So, so today, for instance, I had a um, out-of-state patient come, young girl, 14, in chronic pain for two years for, from a, a neck, neck pain. Wow. And, you know, you're getting the history, um, very active athlete, trauma, falls from being a gymnast or a cheerleader, right? Falling on the head, coupled with motor vehicle accident and um, lots of treatment. Treatment doesn't make anything better. Treatment always makes it worse. Aggressive treatment lights it up. Oops. And so I'm listening to all of this and I'm like, okay, and nothing works. And they are a family that is used to using FSM and the custom care doesn't work. Well, it never not works, but if there's a bunch of generic programs on there just from the mode bank and we're not having the family figure out what is happening. So the first thing I think of when I'm getting this history is ligature laxity. I was going to say, and she's Ehlers-Danlos, right? Or Probably. HSD. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. 
So that's the first thing. So they're saying, you know, all these MFTP protocols don't work. I'm like, it's, it, I understand what you're thinking. The muscles are tight. Therefore I must use this. But so she comes in and that's, you know, she has x-rays and, and everything else. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, that doesn't change my thought process. Everything is reacting because there's torn and broken in the ligament. The dura is going to be involved. The cord's going to be involved. The brain is going to be involved because a 14 year old shouldn't be um, jaded and this is not going to work. And um, in that loop. So that's where the why comes in, right? Like why, why would these muscles be acting like that? Why would her emotional state be in that situation? So the biggest problem we have with FSM is all the options, right? We have laminates and laminates and rows and rows and rows of, of options, which is fantastic. But for a new practitioner and even a seasoned one, right, you're, you're thinking like, where do I go? So like you always say with a new patient, you know, like, I just don't want to make you worse. So this poor girl has been getting poked and prodded and everything that somebody does is aggressive, right? That's all I'm hearing. It's aggressive traction. It's aggressive manipulation. It's of course it lights up. And of course it feels worse because the muscles are in spasm to protect her spinal cord. Yeah. So beating it up is going to make it worse. That's duh. So in she comes four machines and something else I want to touch on is, so it's not always about smush, right? Like, yes, smush is, is, is a thing and we love it, but sometimes you just have to like take your hands off and let the patient breathe and you can watch smush happen in their face. Their face softens, the blinks slow down. And I'm like, how are you feeling? Now, this is a girl who says that she doesn't get stoned when it runs, right? She doesn't fall asleep. It just doesn't work. And granted, I had four machines running, but and she didn't stand a chance because I knew what I was doing. But she falls well, asleep, right? And it's like, okay, so you don't always have to have smush and your patients don't always have to fall asleep. But it is helpful when that happens. And you can just see her poor little nervous system Take a breath, right? The it's one twenty-four and one hundred, one twenty-four yeah. and seventy-seven. Yep. Four and ten. Yep. And subacute disc. Yep. How, how'd you know? And then there was a whole sequence of one twenty-four, four forty-three, um, for the torn and broken in the dura. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um. Then there was um forty. Mm -hmm. 40 and 396, just because, um, 124, 109. Oh, okay. And, and concussion in Vegas. And concussion in Vegas on another custom care. Exactly. That was exactly the two hours today. How did you do all of that with just four machines? You had to at least have had five. Um, no, just four, but two and a half hours. Okay. Oh, okay. Got it. We got to switch. Yeah. Cool. And absence of pain when she got up. And then we had to do a sequence of 40 and 89 because she didn't believe it. Yeah. Well, in 81 and 84, because she didn't know how to move. Exactly. Yeah. And for a first treatment, you know, all it only takes seconds to do that reboot phase because she felt crazy and floaty and out of sorts when she sat up. So you get your patient sitting up eyes on the horizon, feet on the floor, sitting up straight, washcloth in each hand. You don't have to have it set up crazy. And I just had her do a little bit of flexion, a little bit of rotation, a little bit of side bending. Oh, that didn't hurt. You wanna try that again? Okay. <laughs> and then there's more motion. So when we talk about like the whole reboot and neural repatterning and you can get really fancy with it, but you don't have to, if you just end and you should be ending with retesting anyways, whether it's a sensory exam, a reflex exam or range of motion. Yeah. We've got some questions and it's like, I okay. have to uh, 
go to Alf first, even though I, I'll get to you, Thad, in a minute. But Alf said, please explain the numbers for those of us that do not have things memorized yet. Sorry. Yes. So 124 is torn and broken, and the ligaments are 100. And so, and the connective tissue, if you have somebody with HSD or hypermobility syndrome, um, or Ehlers-Danlos, some form of Ehlers-Danlos, it's 124 torn and broken in the connective tissue. And uh, 40 and 10 is inflammation in the cord that takes down the spinal cord sensitization because she's been in so much pain. For a 14 year old who's been in pain for two years, she that's uh, one seventh of her life or something like that. It's a really long time. And um, 40 and 89 is quieting the central sensitization, the part of her brain that doesn't believe it. That's quieting 40 and 89's the thalamus, hippocampus, amygdala, the whole midbrain is 89. Um, 40 and 10, 40 and 396 is quieting the nerve, 396. Did I miss anything else? Okay, so it's, and thank you for reminding us because we're usually pretty good about that, but we got kind of on a roll. Because we geek out with patients and it just turns into numbers. But yes. when, when a young person has had trauma like that between a slip, a fall and a motor vehicle accident, you can expect the muscles to just tighten up and then relax when there's trauma to especially the ALR ligament that runs anteriorly along the neck. So when there's instability in ligature in the neck, the only thing your brain knows how to do is provide stability. And the only way it can do that is to increase tone and contract muscles. And, and the, an it's the anterior is the um, anterior longitudinal ligament. The right. ALR ligaments are way up here at the top. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, and it really makes me almost sad that I, that we have the myofascial pain protocols on there because it's never the muscle. No. Those protocols were written in 2002 before I figured out that it's never the muscle. Right. So, and, it, and it will help a little bit, but not always. So, and this is why, you know, when I program custom cares for patients, why I think it's so important that you have the option to have the prescription expire so that you can check in with patients and make it as um, customized as possible. So this girl doesn't need MFTP short or long. She needs a ligature laxity. She needs a specialized program running everything that you just talked about. And you can run it in 30 minutes. And that's the thing too. Like when you have a pay, like no 14 year old wants to sit, you know, supine for two hours and you don't need to, it's all about customizing something for your patient that they're going to do. The custom care only works if it's on the patient running, <laughs> not in their backpack. Or yes, exactly. So I wish more practitioners would tinker with the mode bank, right? And you can clone the mode. You can start with, with something and then just click things off that are, that's not applicable and add things that are applicable. So the more you tinker with it, the easier it is, but, you know, thinking about it, it's like, I can't, I can't remember the last time I just brought something in from the mode bank and didn't modify it on that patient's prescription. Yes. No, that doesn't need to be four minutes. It needs to be 12. And this needs to be, don't just take off 284 because that doesn't, that's not a thing. <laughs> and or put in 284 because they had bleeding in their sinuses. Yeah. It, like who knew? Well, right. we do now, right? And the mode bank is fantastic, especially now, like there's so many like post-op and um, everything you can think of. I know you've added and added and added and added to it, but it's not the gospel. It's not meant to just, you know, plug and play. It's a starting point. And sometimes you're changing the wave slope. Sometimes you're changing the polarity on it. Sometimes, I don't know, the more, the more I prescribe things, the more I'm trying to keep the program short 
like shorter, you know, sometimes, yes, you have to run a really long program and you can run it at night with the magnetic converter, but sometimes you just need to have a patient plugged in for 20 minutes or half an hour and they can run it back to back. If they have more time, run it twice. Right. So you have to do what, um, what they're going to, what they're going to adhere to. The, the analogy to cooking is really helpful. So when you first start making a recipe, you, it says a teaspoon of this and a tablespoon of that and two cups of this and one of that, right? And then you do this and that. And then the first time you do it, you do it exactly the way it's written. Well, then after you've made it two or three times, you get to the point where you it, taste it it's like it just needs a little bit more whatever rosemary oregano salt whatever yes and you tweak it and the more comfortable you get so new students it's really helpful to have the mode bank totally and it's the thing that's changed the most about the core and especially about the advance the advance is almost painful it, it really is because it's like, I'm really sorry, you guys. But the core, it took me until three years ago to figure out that what, I'm, what we're teaching is how to think. And there are days like in my life, in 25 years of doing this, I've never had anybody who had a sore spot on their iliac crest that didn't respond to the frequency for periosteum. I have never had a patient with a compression fracture at T12L1 where the bleeding caused adhesions in the nerve. And every time she turned, she's tractioning the T12 and L1 nerve roots. So today was the first time ever in 25 years I ran scarring in the periosteum and scarring in the nerve from the spine to the iliac crust. How many times have I done this? How many times have I missed it? That's the scary part. But there's, this is really a perfect technique for people that have a low boredom threshold and enjoy lifelong learning. It's that I think you have to be um, willing to be wrong, right? And being open to different hypotheses that you have to be flexible with your thinking, I think, yeah. to really, really, really do well with this. Because if you're so stuck on, um, no, it's, it has to be this, or um, this only, this will, will take 12 weeks to heal, um, or it, it's, no. No. And for the thing for me is when, when I went to college, right, you take all of these classes, you study really hard and it, when you get out into life, you find out that you don't remember the content. You don't, I don't remember what I did in Chem 101, right? but it trains your mind. So the thing that college courses do for you or even high school courses, they teach you how to think. And so they change the way your mind works. So FSM teaches flexibility of mind and to a certain extent inquisitiveness and precision right? So you have to think about, okay, that's not it. What is it? So right. like this PSSD patient. Okay, what is it? That didn't work. That didn't work. This kind of worked. It's just, it's really interesting. And then you have to be willing ultimately with this patient, 
it's not going to be success is not going to be something that I achieved this week when he's here. Right. It's going to be try 5-HTP. Have you thought about a service dog? Something that will love you whether or not you're better. Right? Right. Do you like dogs? How about cats? I'm allergic to cats. How about dogs? How about a service dog? What kind of dog do you like? Right? You take somebody with anhedonia and you ask them what kind of dog they like. Mm. And their face lights up. Right? It's pretty fun. What I love about what we do is the options outside of FSM, because you are forced to think of things that you never used to treat. When would I ever care about emotions in physical medicine? I treat muscles. I help athletes recover. I don't care if they're scared or if they're sad or if they're frustrated. Angry. Or angry, but I wrote a case report that treating the emotions helped release somebody's gluten hamstring that was that was tight. Speaking of tight, I want to talk about the difference really quick because somebody had asked this a few podcasts ago and we never talked about it. When something has, there is a difference when something is tight, and I'm doing air quotes to the podcasters that are listening, and when something is um, has increased tone. Just like when something is weak, quote, bunny ears, and when something is inhibited, right. there's a big difference between these two categories. So a marathon runner or a track star doesn't have weak hamstrings or weak glutes. Just say that out loud. <laughs> Especially when they have a weak hamstring or glute on one side. Exactly. Like just say that out loud. How does that make sense? It doesn't. Something can get inhibited. It can get temporarily shut down or hijacked when there's something else going on. Things don't get weak from outer space and they don't get tight from outer space. Everything, this is when that why question starts happening. Why on earth would a track and field star have a weak hamstring? If you can just string that sentence together in your forebrain, you might unlock the doors into, oh, it would never be weak. It's probably inhibited. Why would something be inhibited? Well, there must be an injury somewhere else. What could the injuries be? Ask the question, follow the spark, do an assessment. So like. Well, and think about what the cerebellum is trying to protect. That's those three slides that are now in the core. So I used to jam them all into one slide so like the adductors she had yeah. adhesions in between the femoral nerve the adductors and the quadriceps and that turned off her glutes and that caused her hamstrings to be injured right because the hamstrings the cerebellum didn't even think about turning off the hamstrings because the hamstrings are such a weak extensor why would you bother right Okay, so I expected people to be able to extrapolate from that to everything else. And it turns out they don't. So then there's now a slide about if the subscapular nerve is adhered to the subscapularis muscle, that's an internal rotator and adductor. So what is the cerebellum going to do to protect that nerve? Right. It's going to turn down, not off, down the external rotators and the AB ductors. Right. And that makes your brain hurt. But then what does that lead to? So, the, so that one slide took the basic principle. And so the patient shows up with bursitis and tendonitis, partial thickness tears in the external rotators and the abductors and bursitis because those external rotators have as their job to depress the humeral head and keep it from running into the tendon and the bursa. Right. Right. So, and then what was the other one? There's three slides about that now. Oh, and the neck. The, if you've had a whiplash injury and any sort of like 
every drop of blood has fibrocytes in it. So you have a whiplash injury and it's kind of like road rash inside your neck, right? Well, is your cerebellum going to let you turn your head if your vagus nerve is glued to the fascia? Right. The cerebellum this year, the thing came out of my mouth. The cerebellum does not negotiate, nor does it notify. <laughs> like you don't okay. need why you don't need to know why it is that I'm not allowing you to turn your neck past 40 degrees. Just not you don't need to know. Yeah. And so you treat adhesions in the vagus. And in the case of Tom Ackfleck, adhesions in the dura and the nerves. And then his range of motion went from 40, 30, 40 degrees to 70 degrees in 45 minutes. Wow. And that's those three slides. It's the conceptual framework that you're talking about. The yeah. flexibility of mind, the why. Yeah. Why? Well, if I just tear the muscles, if I just work harder on the muscles, then the range of motion is going to increase. Uh, no. Yeah. That's what I did in 1998, 99. And for some patients, apparently it worked. Right. But the real key has been figuring out that it's never the muscle. My right. apology to John Sharkey and, and um, uh, David Simons. Sorry. Well, if, if it were, and I will pose this, you know, for, for your hungry brain, if it were just the muscle, if it were truly that easy, then manual therapy and exercises would fix everything. And they don't. And that's why we have a job. And that's why, that's why I'm booked <laughs> until July. Exactly. And I do manual therapy and I do give patients exercises but, you know, like in this case of this, uh, this girl that I was treating, the exercises make everything worse. Of course they do. And they make things worse in a lot of people. And that's not to say that you, you don't need strengthening exercises. Anybody that has ligature laxity will need some sort of exercise rehabilitation when the time is right. Yeah. When the time is right. Patients that are in high levels of pain, so seven out of 10 and up, you could never expect them to contract a muscle ever, never, ever. I'm going to make my own slide that says that because unless you remove the source of the pain, the source of the trauma, the pain generating component, the cerebellum, like you said, does not negotiate and will never allow for a, the contraction to happen or B, for the nociceptive component to calm down. Like that doesn't make any sense. Well, and the other thing about strengthening, we have so much fun today. The low back patient or the lady that had the compression fracture and was an 81 and 10 and I treated the abdominal adhesions. Um, she, after I treated her yesterday, she came in today and she said, I could actually move my hips. It's like, I actually have, you know, a swing to my hips. Mm -hmm. So while I was finishing with the first patient, Susan put her on the reformer in the gym and started her using those muscles. And the patient came in and said, that felt really weird. And it's like, okay. So after I finished treating her today with scarring on the nerve and 81 and 10 again, I, we went back into the gym with a wrap around her neck and a wrap around each foot and put her on the reformer. So non-weight bearing, two springs, right? Light weights and had her, and she's an athlete. She rode polo ponies, which is a crazy sport. Yeah, that's so, true. And so had her push and she went, it's all wiggly. And so we were doing 81 and 84. We did 81 and 84, and then Sandra did 81 and 92. So, sorry, Alf. So, increased secretions in the cerebellum because the reason she felt wiggly, air quotes, was 
the muscles weren't coordinated because so many of them had been inhibited. Yeah. Think about what a reformer does and allows you to slide and it causes you to contract your core muscles. Well, think about the compression fracture at T12 L1 and the scarring in the T12 and L1 nerve roots. Are those muscles going to contract? Uh, no. Never. And I never would have thought of that unless I'd gotten rid of the adhesions. So we did increased secretions in the cerebellum and it took about 10 minutes and probably eight or 10 contractions along, you know, extending foot or trunk. And then because her adductors, pectineus and the brevis, because of the increased tone in those muscles, 81 and 10, relaxed, increased, decreased, descending inhibition, relax those tight internal rotators. Well, our external rotators haven't worked in probably 12 years. So Susan, bless her heart, pointed out that, no, you need to keep your knee in neutral. Let's externally rotate your feet so that the external rotators are biased. And then when she did the slidey thing on the reformer, her external rotators got to work and the internal rotators were no longer inhibiting them while you're running increased secretions in the cerebellum. Mm -hmm. And Sandra ran increased secretions in the sensory and motor cortex and that smoothed everything out. Yeah. We went back to, at first we had to run quiet the midbrain because she's used to everything hurting. Yeah. So afraid to move it, you take yeah. that out. Yeah. And then I did uh, quiet the activity of the cerebellum because mm -hmm. the cerebellum has been kind of stupid for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So, well, ill-advised. The cerebellum has been ill-advised. Yeah. 10 years. So you do quiet the cerebellum, quiet the midbrain, quiet the cerebellum, and then increase the activity of the cerebellum while she's moving, then increase secretions in the sensory motor cortex. And then they did increase secretions in the cord and the nerve. And you could just watch the movement get more and more smooth. And you could watch her strengthen. Yeah. And look on her face as she... It's so empowering to see somebody. I mean, there's a reason why in the sports course, we do that for an entire day. Mm -hmm. It's, we call that wipe and load. So that all that quieting, you know, the longer a person has had a condition or the more movement patterns a person has had to compensate through something, maybe the more time you have to spend on that quieting because, you know, and it's not even for an athlete, you know, somebody that checks groceries all day long that does, you know, left, right with their arm, like I'm pretending to scan groceries. Um, they're doing that just as much as any football player is throwing a football sometimes. So um, it's not that it's so easy to just increase the secretions or increase the activity of sometimes you do have to spend a little bit more time, what I say, wiping, you know, or just quieting the activity of that improper movement pattern and then convincing the midbrain you're not in pain anymore. This actually feels good. And look what happens. Look how good it feels when the right muscles fire. Yeah. Right? And then like, and the right muscles won't fire until you quiet down the midbrain who's saying, no, no, that's going to hurt. Exactly. And being a neuro geek, you look at the pathways. So this, every, everything goes from the sensory and motor cortex that says, I want to reach out and do this, but it, it takes a side trip through the hippocampus and the thalamus and the amygdala through the midbrain. It takes a trip through the midbrain and the midbrain regulates everything. Mm -hmm. It says, yeah, no, no, you can't do it that way because that's not safe, that's gonna hurt. So you're gonna do it this way. And then from the midbrain, it goes down to the cerebellum and the cerebellum says, right, okay, so we have to turn that muscle off and that muscle off, but we can use this muscle that much and that muscle, okay, got it. And it, it 
it starts in the sensory and motor cortex, but you, it, you, and then it goes from the cerebellum down. Yeah. So once you see that pathway, you can't ever unsee it. No. And once you can manipulate it, so first you have to tell the thalamus, it's like, no, get over yourself. It's better now. Yeah. Like really, it's going to be fine. It is not. Yes, it will. I promise. Okay, fine. And then some there it's once you can control or in let's not say control let's say influence the nervous system directly yeah then it's you know these are the cases that you know wake me up in the morning like i get to go to work and do this again with that patient and that whole loop that you just talked about is good for for me I, I run it on all my patients at the end because it helps just close the case like so often especially before fsm you would have a patient that would come in and you would get really great results in your clinic with you know adjusting or manual therapy and how often would that patient come back a week later and said i was great for a couple of days and then it all came back well, why did it all come back? Well, because of that loop that you were just saying, there's, you didn't influence anything with the central nervous system. It was well, just like a Band-Aid. Yeah, and it's the compensations. That's the other thing is the, you, you fix the primary problem, fixes in air quotes. So you fix the primary problem but then the compensations that the nervous system has had in place are no longer necessary. Right. That's why the standard, how many treatments is it going to take twice a week for four to six weeks? Seriously? Yeah, no, really. And if you're done in three visits and you're done in three visits twice a week for four to six weeks, because the first session you treat one set of things, the second session you treat the compensations mm -hmm. because because this, the external rotators have a partial thickness tear and the subscap is adhered to the subscapular nerve. Because of that, the lower trapezius hasn't contracted in six years. Right. The brain doesn't even know that it's there. The serratus doesn't stabilize the shoulder because if you do that to the shoulder blade, then you're going to do this to those other muscles. Exactly. You treat the apparent problem, but the second session is you retreat the apparent problem and then you start treating the compensations. Mm -hmm. And so it's just twice a week for four to six weeks. Right. Even when you did magic the first time. And now that we know, because 20 years ago, I had no concept of, of being able to integrate all of this by treating the nervous system, not the faintest clue. Who knew? It's right. so cool. Yeah. Yay. Let's answer Thad's question before we move on a little bit. So Thad had asked, have you tried any calming frequencies on the sympathetic system, like 40, 82, 284 on A um, with 562 and 6 on B in regards to tachycardia? So the thing with the sympathetic, it's a really good question, Thad. And the thing with the sympathetics is that they will accelerate heart rate according to demand. So if you get stressed, so the other, the other day I was, oh, we were at the, um, at the practicum. And I put a pulse ox on myself. Now my resting pulse is 62 to 67. My pulse standing up teaching was 82. Hmm. It's like, I don't feel agitated. I don't feel sweaty. I'm fine. But sympathetic stress is performance because I'm teaching, I'm moving around and my heart rate's going to go up. That's where the sympathetics come in handy. I use 40 and 562 to quiet the sympathetics more with anxiety. Mm -hmm. So that the stress system 
it works really well for that. The sympathetics, it's easier. You can actually do both. But the vagus has as its job, if you look at the job of the vagus nerve, its job is to slow the heart rate. So you can quiet the sympathetics, but the sympathetics aren't in charge of turning down the heart rate. Does that make sense? To me, I'm it not, does. Yeah. I'm saying it right, but it's, it's like you can quiet the sympathetics, but the way to get somebody out of VTAC or atrial fib, if you're going to be able to, if the electrical system in the heart is intact, you can run increased secretions in the, in the vagus nerve and quiet it down. So I have a 80 something year old patient and is he's in and out of atrial fib and the electrical system in his heart is just shot. It's just, it's 82. It's like a house with hundred year old wiring in it. It just, the, the insulation's frayed and you run increased secretions in the vagus and I can still get his heart rate down. Takes a while longer. And quieting the sympathetics doesn't work because his heart rate is elevated, not because of sympathetic stress, but because the AV node, the nodes in the heart and the wiring between the nodes is just not working. And the vagus isn't the connection between the vagus and the heart. This is my idea about it. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, why would increasing the secretions in the vagus work? Right. Why would it work? So the wiring, the vagus is still connected, but the wiring within the heart is frayed. So it's a good question, that I like it. And I need you to email me about that stuff that you told me about at the advanced. So, okay, cryptic yeah. message for Thad. Well, he has actually a copy of the original list of frequencies that Harry got it, with, a, it, we looked at it, it's a radio class machine that was in the clinic that Harry walked in. Wow. To. And that has the original booklet that came with that device wow yeah he's got the coolest collection of antique weirdness cool. that is super cool yeah um minette's comment i have to just say that i think at one point i have to thank covid i probably would have never discovered fsm i discovered it from another pt via a live seminar and we talked about alternative ways to help our pediatric population one of my favorite things at going to the advanced is just hearing the stories of how everybody landed where we landed, because it's not like you learn this in PT school or chiropractic college or, or anywhere. We have all come across it from different practitioners or patients forced us into it. As much as I crossed my arms and scrubbled up my nose at it, look at me now. <laughs> I mean, from the biggest skeptic to having a podcast talking about it. <laughs> Why it took so long, people back in 2000, 2004, five said, why isn't this more widely used? And it, what I've come to recognize is that why, why would you believe it? So FSM has always, like we tried advertising we try, even when we went to exhibits back when there were exhibits in person, you believed what it did when you got treated. So you could walk by the booth and look at our data and the cytokine data by itself and the bioimpedance analysis data by itself. And all of that is just like, wow. But the people that came to the exhibit and then came to the class with the people that got treated. And then you hear about it from someone who uses it. And when you hear about it from somebody else besides me, 
then you believe it. Yeah. Otherwise, why would you believe it? So I think we've, we've, we're coming close to reaching a critical mass of people who tell people, who tell each other about what FSM does. Yeah. And then you believe it or you get treated. And I've, we've actually had some patients who pay to send their therapist to the course. Yeah. I need this and I know you don't want to go, but I will pay for you to go. You have to go to this course so you can treat me. Yes. That's actually happened. Yeah. I believe it. I think that's, oh, we had a couple more little things. Um, what is the best way to support nerves after shingles? We got to run through this because we're almost at time. Client doesn't have um, peripheral hepatic neuralgia. We just want to support the myelin sheath. It happened in her seventh cranial nerve. So she has been feeling pinging in her head. In the advanced summer, we have, there's a frequency for peripheral myelin and central myelin. You could do 81 and 49 about that. Um, oh, that's a good point, Dad. Um, and the seventh cranial nerve doesn't start in the medulla. It starts effectively in the pons. So it's the next level up. So you could try trauma, inflammation, and vitality in the pons and in the myelin. I do increase secretions in the myelin, but not in the pons if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to think about what, just in case we're doing what we think we're doing, do you want to do that? So increasing secretions in the ponds, the ponds does a lot of things, so I'm not sure I'd want to do that, but increasing secretions in the myelin, that can't be a bad thing, I don't think. Right. That makes sense. Good. And then Thad's last little comment. I also suspect that calming the sympathetics together with increasing vagus may help when tachycardia is aggravated by food allergies. This is a very long topic though. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. And then you get into histamine and macrophages and the tachycardia aggravated by food allergies. Okay. Stay with me for just a minute. Okay. Just hang in there. So food allergies are often, especially IgG food allergies, which I think is what he's talking about. Because IgE, I mean, you turn bright red, eat a shrimp, turn bright red and fall over. So that's not tachycardia. But you eat something you're sensitive to and that's a macrophage mediated um, condition. Yeah. The macrophages gobble up the um, antigen antibody complexes, the macrophages explode, they release histamine, histamine stimulates class C pain fibers, and the vagus has as its job to regulate T cells and macrophages. Hmm. So quieting the sympathetics might be a thing, but histamine in, histamine in the sympathetics, would that work? Maybe. And then increasing secretions in the vagus because the vagus has as its job to shut down the macrophages. Right. I don't know. That could be fun. I like yeah. that hypothesis. <laughs> talking to you is so much fun. It's so inspiring. It's and what's so great about talking to you is you've been doing this longer than anybody and you're still like, hmm, I wonder if we did that. <laughs> it's, it's a lifelong learner thing. It's yeah. you just Think back, I had a, a physics teacher in pre-med who said, you think back to first principles. So I wanted to do this, this, and this as a way of solving a problem. He said, no, 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 go back to first principles. And you go back to the original equations and you go back to first principles. So what does the Vegas do? What is the mechanism of food allergies they don't come from space what's the mechanism of allergies thank you jeff bland 
right? Thank you, Vince Marankovich, especially thank you, Vince Marankovich. And may he get extra points in heaven for what he taught everybody. So it, and then you, it's synthesis. It's so much fun. So much fun. It's so much fun, fun that we started early and we ended late today. <laughs> Imagine my surprise. It's officially <laughs> McMakin time. Thanks everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the questions. Keep them coming. We will be here same time, same place next Wednesday. We'll talk to you all then. See you then. Bye. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.